Ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the second panel discussion today. It will be population health and the role of innovation. Um, and we have, I guess, a mission, which is that we believe there's an unprecedented opportunity for Asia to transform its health care uh, at a patient level uh, through that convergence of tech with health. Um, when we look at population health, in other words, when we get into that discourse, we see population health as the entire income uh, pyramid. Um, and we have, I think, for the last few decades, seen far too much emphasis around investment in care at a top end of the pyramid to the detriment of even that value segment of the middle. Uh, and I think there's an opportunity to significantly improve that now that we're seeing the price point of point of care dropping fast through either technology, miniaturization, price points dropping in terms of the equipment, but also in terms of business models being um, more easily built without the same barriers to entry that have always existed in health or healthcare, in the industry of healthcare. Um, so it's really how do we overcome the lack of awareness that exists in the population around disease, the lack of access to health care, let's say, and more importantly, of course, the affordability issues that exist at healthcare level. And until we grapple those in any uh, co coherent, collaborative way, we'll consistently continue to see the same issues we're seeing in most of developing Asia, at least anyway, as it relates to improving healthcare and containing the growing disease burden that exists in those markets. Now, Asia does have two speeds. It has mature Asia that is facing the same challenges that we're seeing in proxy markets, Western markets, let's say. And there's developing Asia, which is the greater majority of the population that needs to um, address its own health care uh, needs. Um, and I think, coming back to the original point I was making, we think that health tech provides a significant opportunity to, avoid, to allow the patient to take greater ownership of their health and not rely on the establishment to do so. Thanks for the orientation. Let me come back, Joanne, to you for a moment and just look at some of the opportunities we have to ask ourselves. Are we spending our resources and in innovation the right way? So let's look at a population and segment it and ask ourselves, are we doing the right thing? Are we looking at the most needy and prioritizing that? Are we looking at the biggest band of cost improvement potential, health improvement potential, think of some of the chronic diseases that create that burden. Are we still in a maybe a hangover of just popular or latest technologies being the most important things to invest in to make us seem as though we're a leading economy here in the jewel of Southeast Asia? What, what are your thoughts about just where we're spending our dollar? I think it's a, well, that's a very important question, and I think our Ministry of Health is grappling with that right now. You may know we have ACE, our new, our new agency, which is you know rapidly growing capacity to try to answer some of those questions. I think the uh, there is a clear recognition that in the past we've been very led by technology itself. The technology is here, let's apply it. And because we have a healthcare landscape that thrives or is built on competition across clusters, we've had a lot of what we think of as the medical device arms race on a small scale level, you know, across even within Singapore, which is not always efficient. But so my sense is that um, we are those are questions that have not been answered in a systematic way for Singapore. I think there is a recognition that we can do better. There is a, a now a clear effort at the public level to try to make sure those, those resources are managed correctly by, for example, systematically undertaking sort of health technology assessments, trying to weigh the effectiveness of, of certain technologies versus the equity implications. I think we're very early days yet in that process. My sense is that, again, because we have been so competitive and the incentives have been to move forward with those technologies sometimes um, without the cost effectiveness analysis that we've seen duplication sometimes. We've seen adoption of things that are easy to adopt for populations that are very visible. Um, to me now, the war on diabetes, in fact, could be a good thing or could be a bad thing. It's a great thing that it draws saliency to this topic. But on the other hand, it is also becoming a very strong pull towards a disease-centric approach. Whereas in health systems, I think for a long time, we have begun advocating that we should be looking at system resiliency. We should be looking at adaptive capacity across different disease areas and moving towards strengthening of our primary care rather than a disease 
focus. So I think we're still working this out. Um, the governance and the leadership around this, I think, is, is forming. And my sense is that everything else follows from that. But let me just ask one follow on there. You mentioned something provocative at the end of I re did, okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> Rebalancing to imagine how to bring the type of primary care that's actually needed. It wasn't just about the technologies and making things or more information available with more sensors and the like. There's no doubt that that's exciting, but that personal touch or that interaction with the primary care to take more, you know, have greater engagement. Are you actually seeing investment there or is that part of the cultural mind shift that has to take place before we can see dollars being spent on making accessibility in that fashion available? So I think here in Singapore, um, I mean, we can also talk to some of the regional work that we do. I think in, in the rest of the region, it's not so clear. I think with the reorganization of the clusters and the, the division of the polyclinics among the different clusters, there is a move on two levels. One, to integrate the polyclinics more uh, closely with tertiary care. And then at the polyclinic level, I think that there is a recognition with, I think, new leadership being put in place to make sure those polyclinics integrate with community health screening and things like that. So I see those initiatives going on. Um, do I think that, it, I think at the moment it is still, in my opinion, rather ad hoc, but these initiatives are happening. There's also, I think, more of a recognition that um, alternative systems like traditional Chinese medicine, we're seeing more investment in research in how to integrate TCM, and a recognition that people are seeking care in these different places. I see more outreach towards the GP community. Uh, we have now our family medicine clinics, which are trying to integrate the family medicine practices in the private sector with the public sector. And I think all those are very positive positive uh, positive actions in our healthcare system. So, Dr. Chang, if you can imagine a follow on, I mean, some follow on to that where you've discussed and acknowledged the reality of these ecosystems and they have varying, varying uh, participants. You mentioned telco. It's something we're seeing in the States as well. Just that's not so novel. They're, they see all the data anyway. And by the way, as a partner goes, they understand how to manage really big risk pools and understand how to manage breaches and other things that you'd expect. Are we seeing adequate investment by those organizations as well to address health? Are you seeing them spend in their R&D on their own dime without taking from government resources or others? They just know they want to be in health and they understand their business model can evolve to be productive in health? Well, I think as all, um, you know, commercial enterprises, right? <laughs> We can only invest where there, there is a return, right? Um, and so uh, part of that investment, you will find that in uh, even, even private healthcare, right? The amount of investment in technology in private healthcare, uh, I think far, uh, um, you know, pales in comparison with public healthcare, right? I mean, if you have a million dollars to spend, you spend it on that machine, right? You spend it, right, on your x-ray machines and all that. Because they, they generate money, I mean, they generate revenue. But, but there lies the problem. Okay, so in terms of healthcare, uh, um, telco for healthcare, you will find that uh, I think many of the telcos are, are increasing their spend and investment in healthcare and healthcare related uh, uh, solutions, right? Uh, there's a flurry of activity in that sphere. Um, but also, you know, many of the IT services organization also. And, and this is actually a sphere that is, is um, attracting a lot of attention, right? Um, I think primarily also because there's uh, so many gaps that can be uh, filled, you know. Um, yeah, so, so what we actually need to have, you know, in order to have po uh, effective population health happen is actually connectivity of all the, I, I call connecting the dots. Meaning that, uh, you know, the patient record has to be connected and the patient care record has to be connected anywhere that the patient goes to. And hence, I think recently you've heard about MOH asking, you know, or uh, exhorting, you know, private healthcare to connect to the NEHR. So, so these are some of the uh, gaps that uh, everybody sees. But basically, who's going to fund it is the other problem. Of course, if it's funded by, by MOH, you know, of course the IT services provider, including the telcos, will happily come and do it, right? For, for public, I mean, for private healthcare. So I think um, having the right systems, the protocols, and the financial uh, subsidies or financial, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, financing, the, the right financing in place, I think is very, uh, are the critical components for population health. 
So Frederick, in this discussion so far, we've been talking about are we investing in the right places and look at some of these new entrants that are coming in, but we are still talking about population health. Inevitably, we need to address chronic disease, behavioral diseases, things that are significant within a given population. But when you look at med device, when you look at the technologies that you're imagining, are we seeing adequate innovation targeted at the kinds of realities that population issues are, well, population issues? <laughs> or are we still seeing the stents, the cardi, you know, a lot of the more sophisticated solutions that are so very impressive? Well, you want to elaborate on your thoughts? Sure, I think, I think it's an excellent question and, and um, it brings us to the topic of, of frugal innovation or resource constrained innovation and, 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 and w how we can encourage more innovation for the middle or the bottom of the pyramid. And, and I think the problem very often is that the more traditional um, medical technology companies, for example, they have always focused on the top of the pyramid and they've supplied high-end devices that um, may, may or may not be connected but certainly um, ad ad address the need of, of typically a relatively small proportion of the population. If we look at Southeast Asia, we have about 600 million people here uh, around us in, in, in just this corner of the world. Um, what are the kinds of innovations that would really help some of the rural folks in Sulawesi or in, 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 in parts of the Philippines. And I think there's much more that, that could happen in the area of, of, of resource-constrained innovation. And I think that it's, it's a big topic for many of our members. And the challenge to your point about ROI is how do you ensure that it doesn't just become a one-off CSR project, a uh, corporate social responsibility one-off where you put some money in and, and then walk away. How can you ensure that you have a, a program that, that is sustainable financially uh, for the participating companies? I think that's the real challenge. One follow on there. Do you see any role for public-private partnerships to motivate and encourage investment? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think there are, there are several good examples in, in that area with um, several of our, our larger member companies have done, done work in that area in the Philippines and in India, um, in, in um, setting up dialysis clinics, in, in setting up uh, diagnostic lab centers and, and, and so on. So there's, but there's room to do much more. Yeah. So Julian, in this health tech domain, now we're following, following suit, so many important um, innovations focused on improving the social aspects of care, maybe collecting data in a more, in a grander sense than we've ever done before. But inevitably, this is global phenomenon, our perspective anyway, that there's still silos. It's not integrated in a way that maybe even physicians know what to do with half the data that's being collected. There's no standard of care. There's no context for it. What's good look like? Does 10,000, what does 12 do? What does six do? Or that's a simplistic one, but the context is, is that there's exciting new information being brought to the table. It's not utterly clear that there's standards against which to judge that and integrate it into the more traditional m metrics that we're looking at. And then inevitably they land in silos and not brought into the EHR or maybe conceived of holistically to get that profile of the patient. What, what's going on in, in an innovative context to address some of that reality or those limitations? In Asia, you mean? Yes. Um, it's a challenging question to be able to answer because there's not much going on generally around the world. I think um, if you look at the US and the larger players, the Athena House as well as the Epix, et cetera, they're very happy with that model simply because that's how they generate their value. And so the last thing they want is a breakdown of silos. The last thing they want is interoper interoperability. I can't pronounce the word because it's overly complex, but <clears throat> that's right, um, in between those organizations. But as Thomas Goertz said, the um, editor of Wired uh, back in TED Med a few years ago, um, you know, science is an information problem more than it is a science problem at the moment, or medicine, sorry, is an information problem. Um, and so we need to find a way to, to break down those silos. Um, and some of that needs to be driven by, by government uh, in terms of policy and regulations. Um, and some of that needs to be driven by the, the technology innovation and encouraged by, by the, um, the catalyst that exists in the ecosystem. 
So in a roundabout kind of way, I guess, we're not seeing a great deal of that going on in Asia at this stage. Um, the focal points tend to be very much around um, the pain points as they lie at a patient level or at a healthcare professional level. We are starting to see um, some very interesting value propositions along the rest of the value chain, uh, be it uh, tertiary care, hospital care, for example, all the way into, say, clinical trial um, level. Um, we would like to see a great deal more going on at, to challenge some of the, uh, the, the pain points that you're referring to. Um, I had a pretty detailed conversation recently around what role is HIPAA playing in trying to encourage that kind of silo breakdown through the use of technology. Uh, one of the big questions that comes up is why hasn't HIPAA taken a position on blockchain? in terms of demonstrating the fact that that is a technology that can be leveraged to try and bring about, I guess, the, the trust and the mechanism that allows greater sharing of information and get away from some of the, what I would call, false objections that exist in the system as to why information cannot be shared um, and then therefore start being able to chisel away at some of these walls that a number of corporates have built around them, um, be they an epic, which is a well-established player in the US, or a patients like me, which is a fairly new kid on the block, but again, is making money out of selling data. You tapped on this notion of regulation. I'm going to combine regulations with um, just market constraints or market concerns, realities. Let's just try to go down from this side to you, Joanne, about addressing what you think the most in, uh, concerning regulation that you think limits us making meaningful progress in population health with the investments we want to make or the progress we want to make. And then you could also pivot and say it's less maybe about the regulations because they're not so much constraining us. It's really about the market realities of some of these organizations wouldn't know what to do with their business model if they did, had to be, if did have to be more interactive, interoperable, share data as it were. Just give us your sense, where you're leaning and what you think some of the major concerns are in those two domains, if, if you feel they exist. So is it fair to say your question is, what are some of the, the obstacles, I guess, getting a way of really transforming population health through some of the new technology, business models, et cetera? There's an abundance of ideas, oh, yeah, yeah. amazingly smart people. Mm -hmm. There's a conscientiousness that focuses on something, not just on the engineers developing technology, but the social realities of needing to bring care to all strata of the population. Are we finding the greatest resistance in the regulation domain, maybe in the market behavior of these competitors who are supposed to be investing for the mm. sake of the consumer? Just share your thoughts. All of the above. Yeah. Um, so, no, Next. I mean, it, it's, <laughs> it's an incredible, it's, so my answers are very polarized to health tech, so I will allow my esteemed colleagues to, um, or fellow panel members, let's say, to, to talk through some of the other verticals. But from a health tech perspective, it's, it's a really fast-growing space in terms of the, some of the new ventures and solutions that are coming through. Um, we at Galen Growth are, uh, have an estimate that about 3,000 plus health tech startups alone born in Asia and driving a solution into the market. And that, those 3,000 have attracted some 2.5 billion US dollars of funding in 2016 alone. So that's a substantial amount of money if you compare that to what's happening in the US, which actually enclosed at three and a half, four billion um, for well, half a year this year. So it looks like this year in the US they're going to close at seven or eight, which is the strongest year ever for digital health, health tech. But Asia is, is, is number two there. Um, so the challenges we're seeing are, are really on a number of fronts. Really. At a regulatory level, government level, I think the governments in Asia have been far too timid around trying to define regulations to help um, the startup, let's say, or the entrepreneur move forward, but also to help the other pieces of the stakeholders um, ecosystem be able to define an opinion. Because you're an investor looking to put money into a health tech startup. If the regulations are unclear, you're going to get hesitant very quickly. You still, certainly don't want to put money into an entity that might get closed down overnight because the government, and China's done it at least twice in the last three or four years, suddenly changes the rules and closes you down. Clinicians. Um, need, I think, generally to grow, well, we need to grow the population clinicians that are first adopters into ones that are into that B2 category that are prepared to start adopting, advocating, evangelizing the fact that there are benefits to using that technology. Um, we can talk about corporates, and I'm sure um, 
Frederick can talk about that as well to some extent, but I would describe the attitude of the incumbents in the space to be far too timid. Um, they are starting to wake up, but frankly, I'm seeing far more activity from insurance companies, from telcos, from tech players, than I'm seeing from incumbents. Most of it's PR, it's enabling the CEO to talk at Wall Street about what they may be doing, but if you really dig into the ground, there's nothing happening other than potentially digitizing their own value chain, which means I'm now giving an iPad to the sales rep to go and talk to the doctor. That's not health tech, sorry. You're not improving health care with that. Uh, so anyway, I, I mean, I could go on and on, but to give you a flavor that if you look at any of the stakeholder groups, you'll find at the moment there is a point of resistance there that we need to try and overcome. And so, you know, our, our purpose at Galen is to try and create greater integration between those stakeholder groups and drive that forward. Um, so your question was whether regulation is, is, is a hindrance for innovation in this part of the world. Cite some of, it's either that, yeah. or is it market? Is it a little bit and of I, both? I, I'd say certainly uh, regulatory pathways, the com complex regulatory, as I mentioned earlier, the complex regulatory environment across the region is, is absolutely a problem. Um, and um, although there are a number of regional initiatives looking at converging, harmonizing some of the standards, it's going to take a long time. And it's, you it, cited it's, earlier, too, the capabilities of the various countries to even process those. Absolutely. absolutely. Uh, there are new regulations that are being put in place, and, and they don't have anyone trained, really, to review the dossiers, and that's, that's a huge problem. I think what's positive is that um, some countries are starting to recognize that there is an opportunity to fast-track innovation. Um, so you have in China, the CFDA now has something called the Green Channel, where they will fast-track particularly innovative new technologies. Uh, so they have a whole separate regulatory pathway uh, to get new products, new innovations to market quicker. Um, and I think exploring things like um, a, regulator, a regulatory sandbox, perhaps, and that's something that Singapore could look at, um, maybe in, in, and I think you've commented on this, uh, in, in whether it's digital health or, or, or even in non-digital health um, applications. I think that's, that's useful, finding an alternative regulatory pathway to fast track innovation I think is is is, is helpful. But is it a problem? Absolutely. Well I think that um, the two aspects in my mind. One is the model of care. I think today when you look at the the way um, care is or the whole uh, healthcare is organized is organized by specialties, by uh, hospitals and then you have medical centers, you got GPs. Right. Um, if you really want to practice, I think, population health and to have the right financing model that accompanies the, um, you know, and produces the outcome, then it has to necessarily involve, I think, um, whole, uh, uh, I don't know, is it revamp of the whole medical uh, provisioning system, you know, to one where it actually focuses on the patient. And, and uh, you might then have to have a new breed of a lot of uh, PCCs, you know, patient care coordinators, um, who are like semi-medical uh, in training, right? Um, and then you would also have to have a more kind of, um, uh, what is it, internal medicine uh, people, or, or you're right, or family medicine. Uh, and then you get into the era where you have uh, maybe less specialists, but more of these types of, uh, you know, general uh, practitioners. And the whole idea is to facilitate this whole environment where it is possible to keep healthier be only because of our you know, constant monitoring and the ability to actually provide care around that patient. I think once you've got that whole model of care correct, then you would be able to uh, resource you know, and, uh, and plan for the, um, the specialization uh, better, you see. Um, and once you have that, then the financing will automatically follow because it should um, go into a kind of a capitation model whereby for X dollars, you know, you try to keep the patients as healthy as possible within it. And to me, um, I think right now the way we are doing our population health is to segment into five uh, segments, you know, the very well and then the uh, elderly well, that kind of thing, right? And, and the chronic sick and all that, right? I, I think all that is but the interim solution. Um, to actually get us to the point where we can practice population health. So I think having the right uh, uh, model of care, and therefore, you know, uh, that can actually determine, you know, the subsequent and, uh, uh, implementation of population health. 
Yeah, I completely agree with everything I think that was said. I mean, I think I, I just want to speak to two things. One is the health technology assessment piece, uh, which is which is the area that I work in. I think the issue is not the regulation itself, but the ambiguity of the regulatory space. So, so as is mentioned, I mean, ASEAN, even just looking at ASEAN, every country is different in terms of the health technology assessment. When we look at med tech companies that are coming here from um, the UK, or from Australia, they tell us, you know, there's a very clear process for health technology assessment that the private sector is very familiar with in terms of submitting a dossier, getting feedback, you know, responding to that, and they're very clear who the stakeholders are and how to move that process forward. I mean, in Singapore, and not just in Singapore, that process is incredibly opaque. The criteria are opaque, the stakeholders are opaque, the criteria are opaque, the follow-up is opaque. And then some of that, I, I believe, you know, is, is changing rapidly in Singapore, but it is a very ambiguous place to be in. So even if we ask people to go ahead and prepare dossiers and make a case for all of these things and investigate the value of that, that technology, it's not very clear where that engagement takes place. And that kind of environment is, is very complicated. So on the health technology assessment piece, I think it's not just the regulation, but the ambiguity or the strategic ambiguity around that, it, it makes it very complex. Um, the second thing, I think, just to speak to what's brought with the, the, the difficulty with sort of segmenting care across doctors. So I'll tell you a, a, a little story about this, which is that the problem that we have now in, in our cluster and other clusters is that we have something called appitis, which is that every clinician wants their own app and not somebody else's app, their app, because every app out there looks something like what they want, but it's not precisely what they want. <laughs> And so we deal, for example, one of the topics that I deal with very close to my heart is gestational diabetes, women with gestational diabetes. I recently had a baby, I had gestational diabetes, not five. Um, and the problem with gestational diabetes is that it's a micro, it, it really is a microcosm of this problem because we have OBGYNs who deal with the problem, endocrinologists who deal with this problem, and then the minute the baby comes out, it's nobody's problem. <laughs> And uh, so I began to do a little bit of work to figure out how to address this in the National University Hospital, and it became clear that, first of all, the OBGYNs were designing their app, and it was going to be one app on one platform. Then, the endocrinologists were also designing an app, but a different app on a different platform, which would also capture all this information separately. And then, from a whole different angle, the nutritionists were also designing their own app, which would target obese pregnant women. I won't say whether or not I'm in this category. I'm, also, I'm obviously a geriatric pregnant woman. Um, but this would cut across these two populations. So conceivably, this poor woman going through this pathway would encounter three different apps, which would track her information somehow, conflicting in every way, no interoperability at all. And then I recently heard that the physical therapists are also coming up with a physical activity app. And so, you know, this, and, and we sorted all this out and we managed to sort of you know, get everyone around a table and talk. But it was amazing that these four groups of people who were all addressing the fundamentally very similar patient population with the same need were at all up to that point invested, thank God, not a lot of resources in developing it, but a significant amount of time in trying to address this problem by throwing an app at it which is just horrendous. And luckily, you know, it's not, not the case. Um, so that's one thing. And then the, the second story I want to tell you is about um, the fact that securing the kind of collaboration that we need, not just within the, the health sector, but outside the health sector, you know, with telcos, for example, is really important and not something that we see in all markets. So now, um, for myself, I'm leading a project now to test um, uh, an app-based solution for video monitoring of DOTS patients for tuberculosis. And this was developed at our National University Hospital. What happens is that, uh, for those of you familiar with TB, you have to take medication if you're on TB for six months. The problem is that you feel pretty good after two weeks, so then you stop. And because of that, we get multi-drug resistance. And so we've developed a platform which basically does video monitoring for people in very remote areas. And uh, it allows us with facial recognition to see whether or not that patient is actually taking their medicine and is very cost effective. We are not able to trial this in Singapore for many reasons. For many reasons. And they have nothing to do with the regulation and nothing to do with the technology. But the simple logistic question, enough patients, support from everyone, and willingness to execute. In Cambodia, we are going to do this. We are now funded, funded by the National Institutes of Health from the United States with the support of the Global Fund. So a global funder, a US funder, with the support of the Cambodian National TB Program, so a government policy holder, 
with a, with a local team from the Cambodian University of Health Sciences, so a local academic partner, and Operation Asha, which is the NGO that operationalized the community health workers. All these pieces have to come together to allow us to run this. Right? And the other piece of the app is that we're able to integrate uh, mobile payments into it so you monitor yourself and you get money through the app itself. So we also need a fintech partner that joined us as well to provide that end so that the, so that the patient sees one seamless experience. And the simplicity of that seamless experience is the most difficult thing in the world when so many partners are involved. And having the patience, the networks, and the ability to coordinate all these people Honestly, it, has take, it took us five years to get to that spot, and by that time, the innovation frontier has already moved on. <laughs> so it's a very difficult thing to do. It's a very difficult thing to do to be simple from the patient perspective. Okay, my friends, big finish. You ready? i am put you on the spot, too. We're going to have the audience vote, and one of you gets buzzed. No, I'm kidding. That's not true. Um, Let's put, let's put everybody on the spot. One of the things we heard provocatively uh, in one of the earlier sessions was um, we have low standards. Like, how do we slow the growth curve of increasing costs? What a victory. <laughs> and the provocative idea, I think it was Cole or someone who was mentioning in the payer space, which, what does it look like if the target was five, he didn't say this, I'm offering you this, and here it comes, going to go right down the run here. Three innovations, that's what you get to come up with, to drop cost of care for population health by 20% in five years. What are the big three things you want to see happen that can move the needle materially in Asia? Five years, 20%. What would you choose? And you get the wonderful lead-off batter roll. You want three from each of us? Well, you want three by the time we finished? Three, 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 three. <laughs> and embarrass if you just take the ones that were given before you, so. <laughs> Go ahead, Julian. Um, right. So you're talking from a technology perspective here. I not. Ah, you did not. Anything that you want. Yes, this has been a lot of tech today. They could be non-tech. They could be decisions that, admittedly, did I say investment? I thought I said innovation. I meant to say innovation. So it could be structural innovation. It could be global standards. It could be social investment, like public, private, you know, just anywhere that you want to go. But let's try to get creative with this and, and uh, expand our thinking. Well, as <clears throat> first off, okay, um, so I think there needs to be a great deal more around the, um, the regulations um, for the greater use of, of technologies such as point of care diagnostics or uh, digital therapeutics at a patient level to try and drive um, less burden on the tertiary care and drive it back into the community care. Um, I think we need... Um, These are all five-year horizons. That's something five years. Five year horizon. <coughs> right? We have to stop the bad metaphor bleeding. It's mission impossible then. No. Be creative. You're an investor. I think these are the kinds of interest. Never invest on a five year horizon though, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, then continue as you see fit. What your thoughts are about moving the needle. All right. I mean I think greater regulation I'm sorry, better greater. Um, enabling regulations, let's say. Um, I think greater um, uh, empowerment and enab uh, enabling of community care to use the technology to bring about better healthcare at an individual level rather than pushing everything into tertiary care. Um, I think there needs to be, and I'm going to be deliberately provocative with this one, I think we need to try and move away from academia having the right to get grant funding and retain all royalties to any product that actually gets launched into the market and keep all the profits. I think there needs to be a redistribution of that whole royalty and return mechanism from a solution in the market. Yeah, excellent. What do you think, Frederick? With the risk of there being some overlap, but um, um, certainly if there can be some major progress in the area of regulatory harmonization and convergence, uh, that would, would be a tremendous help. Um, I think the, the, the area of preventative medicine and uh, personalized medicine and Proactive genomics. Proactive medicine? Pers personalized medicine. Genomics and, and uh, uh, being able to detect whether it's cancer or diabetes or, or what have you, at a, at a very early stage. 
um, and doing that throughout large population groups it could make a make a huge difference um, and also to, to to Julian's point getting patients out of tertiary care um, home care is 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 an area with tremendous potential um, and, and just to clarify on that getting them out because they're being it's unnecessary for them to be treated there or do you think that it, it just put some context around well, getting them out? <laughs> there are regional differences here, and I think someone mentioned earlier, it might have been Roland here, that Japan, uh, average number of days um, patients stay in hospital used to be about 34. I think now it's come down, but it's 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 way beyond what is what should be normal. So so there are some 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 very big differences, and clearly there are patients that are are there that shouldn't be there. Um, there may be other cultural reasons and 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 socioeconomic reasons why they're still in in their hospital beds, um, but. Uh, uh, treatment at home as opposed to occupying an expensive intensive care bed is, if that's an option, that's, that's certainly going to bring costs down. Dr. Chang, you have to get, just go off field for us. Tell us something right. that nobody's expecting to hear. Okay, the off field one, since I was a chemist before, is to remove all the patents, all right, from drugs. <laughs> right? And um, yeah, I mean, maybe you could, you should have just a one year protection. I think as long as uh, you know you discover a drug, it should be it should be made generic, right? Uh, so that's I think one way that will cut costs. Uh, the other way is to have a um, a standardized you know medical record that is recognizable anywhere, and, and it's just like you have protocol, right? Protocolized medicine. You should have a protocolized electronic medical record that has got the app and all that behind it, and that's. Maybe that will be, that that will kind of uh, stop the uh, proliferation of all kinds of apps and uh, apitis, is it you call it? <laughs> yeah, apitis, right? So a uh, common medical record across, right? Maybe dictated by who, right? WHO that says, okay, these are all the standard codes and these are all the standard, at least a very standard way of actually um, capturing um, your medical record and your health record that becomes personalised. And the other wild idea, which I think will never happen, is the removal of patents on drugs. <laughs> Excellent. Well, hey, mission accomplished. What now, Joanne? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was. I would say removing patents on drugs is very. It's an interesting idea. It's, it's not clear to me that there wouldn't be a backlash, but it's a very radical. That's a very radical solution. Or coming up with different IP. I think so, for the reason. So just to this cornerstone of justifying investment, you're removing. <laughs> Okay. I, mean, I think empirically it, it, it isn't clear that it actually brings prices down. Well, it depends on the market. But uh, so for me, I think I would say that just to, uh, I agree with the right sighting. I think the right sighting is the easy win, right? We are, we're seeing all kinds of patients in the wrong place at the wrong time. So that I think is, is very clear. But if I were to go completely off script now, I would say what would I want? In the region, basic vaccination. Vaccination coverage in the region is surprisingly, even for the for the you know the regular EPI vaccines, not strong. We we need to focus on that again and if we can bring that up, that's going to do a lot for us. So vaccines. For developed countries, I would say get ready for it. Intermittent fasting. I'm just o addressing obesity. Mm -hmm. Is that what your point? Well, in terms of, not not only that, it extends longevity and it has very very clear effects on health span. So across the spectrum of chronic disease, I think we're seeing a very interesting strand of research coming out of USC now on intermittent fasting. I mean, I think what we've what we've seen in the aging literature, right, is that if we can delay aging by 20 years or even five years, that has effects much more than than targeting any specific disease. Because if you don't die of A, you're going to die of B, right? We have a competing risk model. And if you look at the future elderly model, which we've run for the United States for CMS for the longest time, even if we develop a cancer vaccine, in five years, the economic impact of that would be negated by the fact that every other disease would rise to fill its space. So if we want to have sustainable change, pushing back aging and extending health span is the way to go. And for my money in that space, what I'm seeing now is intermittent fasting. Wow. Um, perhaps I'm reading the wrong things, but that's where, that's where I would look. Um, and then the, the so, so child health, and then I would look at women's health. I would say HPV vaccinations, where I would also put a large amount of money. Um, just because. So that would be a little, so a little bit left field for you guys, something, oh, nice. something different. <laughs> oh, wonderful, wonderful choices. What do you think we can move to some, some Q&A for the, for the team so that we can uh, 
kind of spread it out and make sure we're answering all the questions that some of you might have. Any questions from the audience? In the context of innovation, actually, you can ask them anything you want. That's true. Whatever is left over for the day. <laughs> Zubin. <laughs> So I think it's a great idea uh, Dr. Chong mentioned about removing uh, patents from drugs. But my question is, in your mind, if you, could, if you could actually do that, how would you start that process? You know, what would you do? What would you say? How would you incentivize? Well, I think the first thing I would do is to, uh, as I mentioned, right, um, well, I think just to give some credit to the people who invented the drugs, right, um, is, is a one-year protection. After that, that the drug formula has to made, be made available so you could do generic drugs. I think that will produce the entire, um, in, that will free up the entire drug industry and I think it should bring costs down. Because one, one of the greatest um, bugbears is actually that. You know, um, yeah, uh, all, all sorts of drugs, I think, uh, HIV drugs, whatever, you know, TB and all that, right? Um, we have to actually wait, you know, for a long time. Even cancer drugs, right, you wait for, 10 years, I don't know, what is it, 15 years, before the, the pattern runs out and you could produce it generically. Yeah. Do, do you think one step possibly to get there is actually implement by mandate, right, by law, all hospitals in a country should only be allowed to prescribe generic drugs unless there is no generic drug because of these rules and start at that point which would then force companies to lower their cost of medications if they want to keep the trademarked drug going. That's an interesting idea, yeah. But of course, I think somebody would say, um, yeah, then you are depriving the patients of uh, having the best care, right? So I think it has to be kind of a, move, a worldwide movement. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, because I think you, you will have vested interests and in all that. So I guess they are, yeah? Do you no, it's, just, it's interesting because every time we look or read any article that is trying to challenge a health system, be it the US or NHS, etc., there's always a good old poke at the drug-making firm, which is fine. But if you take the NHS, drug prescription or cost is 8% of the NHS's total spend. You ain't going to save yourself 20% by poking at the drug firm. The other costs need to be addressed. And I think the biggest driver of cost is us. But the, the one point to note in the NHS mm -hmm. is that when we're, when we're working there, we all get taught that actually they, they push for this. They tell doctors, prescribe generic drugs on the prescription. So it's a mindset, and you do. And the law is if you prescribe a generic drug and the hospital cannot, or the pharmacist, pharmacy cannot uh, dispense it, they still have to take, give you the trademark drug at the generic price. So there's a big reason why it's only 8%. Sure. Yeah. I mean, but in the US, I think 80% of drugs prescribed in the US are generic. It's only 20% that I think are prescribed. I mean, as in a, a patented. If you look, I think the Orange Book drives about 80% of the sales, I think, in the US. So I think the, the biggest driver of cost of any health system is individual. I mean, talk to any of your friends if you go back to the UK and ask them how much time they spend thinking about their health versus stocks and shares or whatever. They look at you as if you're being, you know, just stepped off planet Mars, when in fact, the fact that they just don't think about it and just take it for granted means they're actually driving those costs up. Um, but to come back to the question you're asking around patents, I think that's a really hard one to achieve, but I think it can only be achieved if you look at the entire value chain of developing a drug and how you reduce the cost of that. So one of the first steps I think you can take is the one that Bill Gates takes when he invests in any money into any drug, which is that any research that gets published is made available to everyone in the world to, to reuse. Because then you start breaking down the repetition of research, the duplication of research, the um, research that cannot even be repeated. I mean, Amgen, so two years ago, Amgen tried to repeat a number of experiments that had been published in journals, and I think they came back with 40% of them were unrepeatable. They just could not make them work. So you can imagine the amount of taxpayer money, and that's the thing to remember, it's mostly taxpayer money that has been wasted. And so I think every other year there's a report on this topic, 
but it's a pretty big number. It's 80%, I think, at the moment of research that goes into medical funding, sorry, funding that goes into medical research, sorry, is essentially wasted because of those issues that I've described to you. So the Council Moonshot was one of the things that Joe Biden was very clear about, which is we need to break down those silos, because that's where we're wasting a lot of resources, talent and money. Yeah. If I can just comment very briefly on the, on the, on the time frame, I, I think if you set it to one year, it will effectively kill R&D and innovation completely. But if it's somehow combined with, with shortening time to market through working with, with, uh, with, with regulators and, and uh, looking at other ways of, of minimizing that, that, yeah. uh, the, 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 R the typical R&D spend that's happening today, um, maybe there's, there's a compromise. That well, so I was at a conference with multiple cancer center um, heads of research and there was a lot of lamenting about the um, waning productivity of R&D mm -hmm. and he said BS and we are uh, there's a lot of pharma in the audience why are you gonna, you know, what are you doing <laughs> and uh, he said pharma doesn't listen they don't uh, they see the results and they'll still push it through for some incremental gain that somebody has calculated and they still think that they can win it with marketing, they can win it with all of the engines that they can bring to bear in the marketplace. So there's a complex answer. I'm equally shocked by your proposition to move patents because I can't imagine yet what the fuel for innovation is, but it's a fair challenge. But I also think there's a lot of challenges within in the innovation industry within therapeutics that needs a wake-up call. There's something wrong about our incentives to just go and win with a marketing engine, you know, with your product. But anyway. Well, if you allow me, well, well one, one other comment. Uh, I think today, I think the problem with uh, research is that it's, it's very, um, it's opaque. Because the research you do, the research you do is, uh, right, is uh, opaque from each other, one another. However, we use digital technology Right, and uh, you, you, you actually uh, uh, report, okay, all your research. If it's, if, if it's possible to find, okay, um, research, right, around the world, is, uh, you can just Google it, for example. If it's possible to do all that, then we would not actually duplicate, replicate, you know, the same kind of research going on in various places. It's just a provocative thought. I mean, I, I, would, I would agree that all this transparency is really important, which is why we have trial registries and all of these things are so crucial so that we know, in fact, the other thing is that we know about negative results as well as positive results. So that's all very critical. But I do think that from the academic point of view, I want to say that the timeline for innovation is long. The timeline for innovation is long. When we look at drug discovery, it takes a very long time for us to really, for an idea to come to bear and for us to rigorously test it to a level that is acceptable. The time for us to come up with a research idea from idea to publication in a, in a peer review journal is years. And that's the nature of the process of the writing, of checking it. That means we have evidence standards that are good enough for our decision making and then we have evidence standards that are good enough for us to admit it into the canon of science. And that's just inherent to the nature of the beast. I mean, I think the patent system, we hear a lot of discussion about the patent system because fortunately or unfortunately, you have, with healthcare, you have a large sunk cost and then you have a very small marginal cost, a variable cost going forward. And all we see is in this cohort is the marginal cost, the pill that costs a few cents to make. But it is the tip of the iceberg of that very long process, which as you say, we can try to make more efficient, but fundamentally is not going to go faster from molecule to animal model to patient to practice. And when, uh, there's, there's only so much that we can do. We can say that we want to shorten the patent process if we are serving the interests of today's cross-sectional population. But we are looking at the, when we are stewards of population health, we are looking at the population of the future and for that future, we are, you know, we bear the cost of innovation today for those people in the future. And so I, I feel that it's a very, it's a very good argument that we need to dismantle unnecessary barriers, but we need to keep some of those up because tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow uh, depend on us paying those taxes today that legitimately we will get no benefit from. You know. To add to that, that's the first ding, right? That's not the three. Yeah. <laughs> um, I had the opportunity to speak with the FDA and in the drug evaluation group, OHOP, specifically Rick Pazder's group who oversees cancer drugs. And one of the things he was contemplating, so no quotes about this, is a paraphrase in a conversation in a group setting with his team, 
where he was saying, you know something, we're not trying to slow down innovation or extend review cycles, but the truth is, is we have a very difficult time making a decision for market approval when we know it's such an inadequate amount of data and that the truth will come phase four and, and, when, and afterwards, right? He said, but here's what I could imagine. Again, not quoted, just in discussion. Um, greater transparency during clinical trials of all the data that's being generated. You do that, and I can imagine just having months and months and months cut off the review cycle. We'd be so much more comfortable with the quality of data. We could get involved instead of an end of phase two review and other adjustments that are so late and very difficult to recover from. So it's interesting that there are not just the patent side, but even in the regulatory process, there's a desire for more transparency and openness, but yet I'm not sure that's completely bought into. But well, we are an inflection point, though, really, in terms of yeah. you know, just the technology allowing what's now called real-world evidence, but essentially being able to look at phase four exactly right. data, which means that governments are now, or payors, are now being put in a position where we can actually start challenging the industry right. back, saying, right, what is the efficacy? What is the true efficacy of this product? And so hopefully your, your earlier comment around this incremental bit will start getting knocked back. Um, you you know, imagine we'll the interplay if with adaptive trials and other considerations there are meaningful and legitimate inflections that you can make to get at the right cohorts and designs for the right responders, throw in the diagnostics and things start getting really exciting. But anyway, we're uh, overkilling. Yes. Hey, Anthony. Hi. Uh, Anthony Morton Small from uh, my doc. Uh, two things that I, I'm interested didn't come out of the panel discussion, which I'd like to pose back. Um, You're saying we didn't cover something critical? I, 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 incredible. Uh, maybe you didn't. Can anyone escort him yeah. out? Um, so so um, on the health and care front, um, potential shifts to curative interventions and also the adoption of artificial intelligence, um, how far would you let that go? Hands. Um, can you help me with your question? So, what do you mean by how far do you let that go? So, um, how quickly would we allow, would you like to see artificial intelligence come into the equation? Um, how, far would you, how far would you allow artificial intelligence to a, a, adopt a role in care provision? Would you let it supplement physicians? If we're looking at countries across Asia where we just don't have enough infrastructure, we don't have enough physicians, how, how much would you allow AI to, to actually start to sure. take a primary role sure. um, in, in, in covering no, it's a good population question. needs? It's a good question, particularly in a topic that is overhyped. Um, and what I mean by that is that the word AI has been banned everywhere, usually by every startup to try and get more valuation out of their business. Um, most of the startups that I've seen peddling the word AI are really peddling simple decision trees. It's not AI. There's no deep learning in there at all. But to come back to your question, I think your, your question is pretty similar to the hoo-ha that um, Vinod Koshler created about four years ago when he said that 80% of, a, of doctors would be out of work, but he, what he was saying deliberately provocatively because that's his style, was that actually 80% of a physician's role will change significantly going forwards. Now that should be music to most physicians in terms of the fact that having spent seven years five, seven years of being on the country, training, you really want to spend quality time with your patients, keeping them well, than spending three minutes trying to find the first drug you can administer because you've just about figured out a diagnosis because that's all the time you've got. Um, I see AI playing a very fundamental role going forward, particularly with all this data we're seeing, uh, and being able to smartly arrive at a, uh, an outcome in terms of a data point. But I certainly in its infancy and going forwards, would advocate that it's a supporting tool to the physician or the specialist or the surgeon, depending on, on who we're referring to. Um, and, and, and as they get better at it, I guess, you, you continue seeing the physician or healthcare professional be able to move in that more and more in that consultative role um, and hopefully get to a point where we're looking at professionals in healthcare be rewarded for the amount of time you're not ill rather than rewarded for every time they prescribe you something because you are ill. But I mean, that's, that's a lofty desire down the end of the road. But, but I think that's, that, that's where we should see AI when it is truly being used to, uh, to, to help. And so some of the more promising areas are around radiology at the moment, um, where hopefully the radiologist 
who goes just about through the same number of years of training, can start using their time to work with uh, the outcomes rather than spending their time staring at screens all day going blind. Um, anyway, sorry, I'll stop there and hand off, but um, that, that's so where I see let me, it. Let me offer one other thing. I've worked directly with organizations, software organizations, working with cancer centers, claiming the use of artificial intelligence, and I couldn't agree more with Julian in this one. The misrepresentation of natural language processing, the, the, the misrepresentation of very manual learning curves that require expert physicians to sit with software developers and make judgments about recall and precision and other aspects of what these AI engines are supposed to do. At this stage, the best thing that we're seeing, in my opinion, at least in the States, and I am limited in that regard, is a, their ability, these technologies, to process vast amount of, of information and move us closer to evidence-based medicine. And that being disseminated and so forth is very exciting because the variability of care is dropping and that's just good news everywhere. But if you were to ask me about that, is that I, I can't motivate behind artificial intelligence until I see algorithms growing on their own and coefficients moving and suggesting that we know how to tune a machine over time and meaningfully demonstrate that that's uh, adding confidence to, and all we need to do is start with it being a decision support tool. And right now, we haven't really moved beyond um, a very basic service in that capacity. But anyway, please. And I, I, I agree with that. It's, it's very much a decision support tool at this Could point. Right add one more. Yeah. And, and Julia's point about radiology being, being uh, um, at least for now, the, the, the main area of focus for, 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 for AI and taking work away from clinicians. There was an article, I, it might have been in the FT or, or somewhere else, that just in the last couple of weeks that said that um, the uh, physician's role would essentially be eliminated by AI by the year 2053. Um, it, I think it just goes to show so that there, there are so many different <laughs> views and perspectives on what the impact will be of AI, and then you read that it, it's, it's the profession that's going to be least affected. Um, I, I think that it's clearly there are some areas where today it serves as, as solid decision support. I think there are some Tra exciting... I've also heard training, training the yeah. med students Co correct, and Correct, correct. And some, some sort of nurse support in, yeah. in hospital settings and so on. But I think there are some interesting areas of research that are going on today. Uh, at our conference in November, we will have the CEO of Verb Surgical, um, uh, which is the Google J&J &J Joint Venture in Surgical Robotics, uh, do one of our keynotes. and. and and they're looking at incorporating uh, AI uh, into surgical robotics and the, the next generation of surgical robotics. And I think that could be, could be really quite, uh, quite interesting. So there's a lot of exciting research going on in that area. Ladies, either one of you want to have the last word on this? Well, I think in terms of if you want to have a doctor versus maybe an IBM Watson, you know, an AI m machine, right, uh, with the same amount of data, right, to come to a conclusion. I think the doctor will be very skeptical of the AI robot. But however, if, if the AI robot, okay, if you get into the stage where you, know, you are continuously um, assimilating data, all right, then I think that's where the AI robot, right, and the, uh, you know, the, the use of AI, okay, for medical diagnosis, then can become more effective. Okay, Dr. Chung, what the doctor can see. I'll tell you, in this example, that twice now in two different instances, that doesn't seem AI to me. That is processing a greater and greater corpus of data, yeah. right? Yeah. What's not happening is that the algorithm isn't changing to say, you know what, this data is more important than that data, or forget this one altogether, or this diagnosis combined with this metabolic marker, and that yeah. sophistication. Ah, right. It's not really uh, well, yeah, that, that is not around, but uh, it doesn't prevent, I, I think that era will come around, because through aggregation of data, right? Um, the data itself, I mean, the AI, ro the robot will be able to actually know that the probability of these uh, indications, right, is higher than another, and then it will be able to prioritize. So that is the aspect that I think the machine can, can do a better job than the doctor. So okay, waited. only when the data is voluminous. So there it is. Yeah. Bravo. <laughs> Thank you all very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you.